It's also a real honor and a privilege to make an introduction today. Uh, I told um, I told Athletic Director uh, McGarity, you know, gosh, for June, you know, a lot of people are on vacations. This is a really big crowd. I wonder what the connection is, and I think we all know. <laughs> you know, Greg is a uh, 1976 journalism uh, graduate from the Grady College at the University of Georgia, and as a student, he was a letterman on the University of Georgia's tennis team, and after graduation, he began his career in athletic administration right there at the university. He initially worked in sports information and as head women's tennis coach from 1977 to 1981, and he returned to full-time athletic administration in 82 and became assistant athletic director for facilities and event management in 1988. Now this here is where his uh, career kind of had a little bit of a, a turn. <laughs> In 1992, he joined the athletic department at the University of Florida as an associate athletic director. And over the course of 18 years, see, he's a very patient man, you know, he endured a lot. He rose to executive uh, associate athletic director and was the top assistant to athletic director Jeremy Foley. His duties at Florida included assisting Foley in daily operations of the department preparing the annual budget, long-term planning, scheduling, and training. In short, a very big job. And on August 31st, Greg got his homecoming of sorts when President Michael Adams named him Director of Athletics at Georgia. It's been a whirlwind year for Greg, and he's here to tell us about his first 10 months on the job and his future goals of Georgia Athletics. But before we welcome him, I've got to just share one other personal story. Um, I reached out to Lauren Smith and uh, just wanted to know what he might say about Greg if he were being, uh, if he were making the introduction today. And of course I had to say it. I said, Lauren, what do you got? <laughs> and I think in short, and it just goes to, to prove the management style of, uh, of Greg and, and the leadership skills that he brings to task. One of the first things that Lauren said was that uh, when the announcement was made, uh, Lauren really needed to get something written and uh, in the press and he called uh, Mr. McGarity and wanted to arrange a time to visit and to have an interview, kind of an in-depth interview. And I think that it happened to be that uh, maybe you remember this story uh, that uh, maybe it's Thomasville or someplace that uh, that Lauren was going to be anyway. And he said, "Well, uh, I'd be happy to to drive down to Gainesville." And and Greg's answer was, "No, I'll, I'll just meet you up there." And I, I think that Greg is that kind of uh, of a giving servant leader, and it shows up in so much of what he does. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been rumored that uh, when the game time is maybe at 7 o'clock for a basketball game, uh, uh, Greg is there two or three hours ahead of time making sure everything is working and, and in great perfect order. And I think especially on those very special fall game days uh, at another uh, venue uh, not far away, he might be even there a little bit before that. But uh, we're, we're really honored that uh, Greg is serving in this important leadership role and especially on behalf of the alumni board and our fantastic Terry staff that put this together uh, month by month, uh, for which we're very grateful. We want to bid you welcome, and again, with gratitude, thank you for being here. Thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks, Ted, and uh, Dean, it's good to see you, and uh, it's good to be, be with all of you today. It's uh, something, I did a little research before I came today. I, I, I said, this is, I knew they did the podcast on this, so I had to get up there and find out exactly what went on. So I, I was able to do a little research and find out who had been up here before and uh, kind of got sort of the uh, situation as far as how the, the, the speakers had performed in the past. So I said, I've got some pretty big shoes to fill here. But what I planned on doing is uh, just talking for 15 or 20 minutes and then kind of open it up to Q&A because I imagine there would be a lot of questions. And I know we've got like an 830 uh getaway time here, 8.30, 8.35, so we'll go from there. But I do have some planned comments, so I'll kind of uh, uh, just start off, okay? But it, uh, to be able to address everyone this morning as the athletic director at the University of Georgia, uh, it's really still hard to imagine at times. But you must understand that after being in the shadows, lurking in the background for 33 years as a coach and administrator at two of the finest institutions of the country, University of Georgia and University of Florida, that it does take time to adjust to sitting in the chair with a buck stopping at your desk. I have a tremendous amount of respect for people who are in leadership roles 
and are faced daily with decisions that could impact the lives of so many people. But at the end of the day, you must make sure your decisions are based on what is best for your organization or institution and not what is best for the individual. I recall a comment by my former boss, Jeremy Foley, said in a card once, once I got settled back to Athens, it said, at some point in your career, my friend, you will be dealing with some tough stuff. Don't know what it will be, but trust me, it will happen. And though, and though you will always have Cheryl, my wife, to lean on, your staff as well as me, if you so desire, you will at some point feel very alone, maybe a little frightened, maybe a little unsure. You will find peace and inspiration and answers in this book. I know I did. There were times that despite having you at my right hand, I needed a little bit more. Found it here. And I did not want you to ever feel alone, and therefore I send this to you. And that book was the Hope for Today Bible. And uh, that just tells you a little bit. You mentioned servant leadership. Uh, if there's ever a person that practiced servant leadership, that was Jeremy. And uh, that's what we're trying to do in our organization today is, uh, is be servant leaders, try to make those that are around us better people. And we know if we make those around us better people, they'll work that much harder for us. So it's a great book, and I really appreciate uh, Jeremy sending that to me and, 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 as always, his mentorship, even though he is on the other side of the, uh, of the field now. Uh, there have been a few instances where loneliness at the top has happened during my first 10 months at the University of Georgia. But I have been very fortunate to foster relationships with so many friends over the years that I feel very comfortable calling on others for help. I have always felt like it was a strength to be able to admit that you need advice from others. And I've had to try and convince our staff that it's perfectly okay to admit that you don't know everything, that you need help from others. Heck, some of the best ideas we've ever had were stolen from others. You know, today I had probably two or three different directions to go with my talk with you this morning. Uh, I know we had to turn in the subject matter maybe three or four months ago, so uh, I know we had to do that, but I kind of I thought the, the topic uh, would be as far as uh, being on the same page as the University of Georgia, athletics. Uh, there's no question that that is a, a prime part of what we're doing at our institution. Uh, we are no better than any other department at the University of Georgia. We might get more publicity. Uh, we might generate more revenue. Uh, Obviously, expenses go with that, but what we try to portray is that we're just, we're just a segment of the university that's no better than anyone else. Uh, if anybody comes over in our building, I know we've got a few bells and whistles, and, Mark and uh, Mark's been over to see our building up there, and Mr. Culpepper has been over there and seen our, uh, our facility after a great career at the University of Georgia. It's great to see you guys here today, and uh, Where's Will Glenn? I know Will Glenn's here, one of our assistant uh, men's tennis coach, does a fantastic job for us. But you may walk in our building, and I don't know if you have walked in the new Buttsmere building lately, but it is absolutely phenomenal. There are pictures of Knox all over the place uh, for his great career here, but it's really a show place, and there's really something that we're all very, very proud of. But we don't want to be any better than anyone else. We want to be as good as every other department on our campus. And if we can portray ourselves that way, then I think it's going to make us fit better in the campus. It's going to, we're going to be able to sell our story better. We just want to be piece of the pie here. And as Dr. Adams has said many, many times, his goal is to make the University of Georgia the best public institution in this country. It's our goal to have the best athletic association in the country. Now, will we ever get there? You know, I don't know. But we're sure as heck going to try, just like Dr. Adams is trying to do on his end. So... That's our goal. We're all in the same place. We are, we are doing a lot of things with the uh, Journalism School, uh, the Consumer Health, Health and Sciences, the Alumni Association. We did the, for the first time when we went out on the road this year, we did UGA Days. And it was an effort to where athletics and the Alumni Association came together. So we went to Charlotte as a group, and we had Dr. Adams there. We had Mark Fox, Mark Rick. Uh, it was a great show and had probably four or 500 people there in Charlotte. And I know some people in this room were there. But the effort, the message that was being sent was we're all in this thing together. We're all on the same page. It's not athletics over here and academics over there. And that's, that, that is a show of support that we uh, 
I think had a lot of success, and I think as we move forward in the future, you'll start to see us do that a lot more. Um, but in order for the University of Georgia to con continue to move forward in the race to be the be best public institution in the country, as I said, athletics and academics must be on the same page. So many doors are open to the University of Georgia through the athletics window, and we will always strive to make sure our goal and expectations are properly aligned with our academic partners on campus. I could have spoken about growing up as a Baxter Street boy. Those that know the former mayor in Athens, uh, Doc Eldridge, made that comment when he was uh, introducing me to a, uh, a group in Athens. He said, yeah, Greg's a Baxter Street boy, and I had never heard that before. <laughs> so as we got into it, uh, you know, he says, well, he went to Alps Road Elementary, which is on Baxter Street. He went to Clark Middle School, which is on Baxter Street. He went to Athens High slash Clark Central High School, which is on Baxter Street. And Baxter Street dead ends into the University of Georgia. So I have used that, but Doc had, had sort of coined that. Um, but I was a Baxter Street boy and awful proud of it. You know, I could have talked about the wonderful memories of the summers on Lake Burton at Camp High Harbor working at former football coach Frank Inman's uh, camp up at Lake Burton. I could have talked about that a little bit. Or the Saturday night square dances at Mountain City. For those that remember the square dances up in Mountain City, uh, they were a heck of a lot of fun or experiences of coaching women's tennis at the University of Georgia for four years. And kind of what was unusual about coaching women's tennis at Georgia was I was also, as Ted mentioned, I was also the assistant sports information director. So we had to cover different sports and give the recaps of matches and all that stuff. So uh, guess what sport I covered in my SID role? Women's tennis. So you could imagine the spin that I could put on stories when, heck, I was a head coach. So uh, we had some phenomenal wins, I promise you that, and our losses weren't that bad, okay? <laughs> so it was kind of interesting. But you got to remember, too, that was, that was long before computers, email. The only way of getting your message out was in the newspapers back then. So we could pretty much spend what we wanted to. And, you know, it took a day. If you had a loss, you might not have to report on that loss for a couple of days. So uh, <laughs> we could talk about the Boise State game. Uh, and how that became a reality. And we can get into that a little bit later during the Q&A. But to make a long story short, it took eight institutions to agree to do certain things with their schedule to make all this happen. So uh, we're excited about that. And it's hard to believe it's 78 days until that game kicks off in Atlanta at the Georgia Dome. So uh, needless to say, our, student, our players are excited about it. We're excited about it. And uh, judging from the ticket sales, uh, which is a, a sellout at this point in time, it's great. We're... I know we'll have probably 65,000 Georgia fans in that facility. So, uh, but I was all, also aware by going back and check the webpage and uh, all the previous speakers of uh, I've got some pretty big shoes to fill this morning with the uh, previous speakers that have been here. But, you know, it, it's really hard to imagine what life would be without mentors, without people who really care about others and are willing to spend the time and effort to help others out. That mindset, the desire to be a servant leader, is what separates the good from the great. And I wanted, to, I wanted to take time today to talk about eight of these special people who have been truly inspirational leaders on, uh, along my journey, my 56-year journey. I've always been attracted to successful people. I want to feel like a sponge and soak up all the knowledge and information possible. I enjoy being around positive people, people always, who always see the good in life, the can-do people, people that manage to find a way to get things done in a highly professional manner. It's like I told our staff at the very first staff meeting back in September. Don't walk away from negative people. Run away. <laughs> I learned customer service and compassion through former Terry third speaker, James Shepard. And James is here today. James, it's great to see you and appreciate everything you do for, uh, for our student-athletes. Uh, but it was in the late afternoon after our men's basketball team was defeated by Alabama in the SEC tournament here in the Georgia Dome. You know, you're talking about a gut-wrenching loss. I think we were up by 14 points with four or five minutes to go, and all the TV pundits had said, you know, the winner of this game will go to the NCAA tournament. The loser is going to go to the NIT. So we're like everybody else. We listen to that, okay? So we are in the jar big time after that game. I mean, we should have won the game, and, you know, we're sitting here saying, God, we got 20 wins. It's huge for our program. Mark's got the program going in the right direction. You know, we're not going to the NCAA tournament. Well, I tell you what, I, uh, 
uh, as I left the Georgia Dome and I wanted to get back to Athens as quick as I could. I hate to stick around events when you lose. You know, you just want to get the hell out of there and get home. <laughs> But I, uh, I did, I said, you know what, I'm going to stop by the Shepherd Center and see JT. He had just uh, entered Shepherd the day before. And uh, as I went over there, I, I, you know, it was really just very soon after his, after his injury. And uh, I didn't really know what to expect. So I went up there and, and saw, saw his uh, mom, Tondra, and the other, the other staff. But we were in the ICU waiting room. And, you know, nobody really knew what was going on. I mean, we, you knew what was going on. I don't mean to take that the wrong way, but there was so much uncertainty. You just didn't know you were worried like heck because you, you just worried the worst could happen. But what was really evident was what a special caring place that facility is. I was amazed at the fact that people could be in such an upbeat, uplifting, working environment when surrounded by so much pain and suffering. How was it that people could have such a high level of energy, compassion, and patience? With so much adversity, disabilities, and pain, I wanted to find out how this happens. What motivated people to be so kind, so compassionate, such outstanding customer service? This led to a meeting with James Shepard. He said, Greg, you must hire people who really, really care about people. It takes a special person to work in this environment. Once they are a member of our team, then we constantly work on customer service and taking the best possible we care, care we can of our patient. And I really sincerely appreciate the time uh, that James has taken out of his schedule. I know we're going to huddle up after this and uh, go see JT for a little bit. But I think what was, uh, I don't know if you saw Diane Sawyer last night on the ABC News, but she teased the last piece of the National News last night. They showed a clip of JT and the other young man that sits Shepherds that was a uh, pitcher. Uh, and it was really interesting because the pitcher who is at, at Shepherds with JT got drafted by Houston, and our JT got drafted by Texas. And you're talking about a classy move by two classy organizations. That was uh, great, great stuff. But <clears throat> I think JT's scheduled to enter, uh, come back on campus July 8th, and he's going to be a part of our team, and we hope he's at our institution for a long, long time to get his degree, but an amazing story. Uh, in an unusual way, George... Herbert Walker Bush, Bush 41, okay, not 43, but Bush 41, has influenced my life in the way he has conducted himself after he left the Oval Office. He taught me about being authentic. His remarks at public events like the dedication of the Billy Graham Library or before the Florida legislature during his son Jeb's time as governor or at the funeral of his former boss, President Reagan, he wore his emotions on his sleeve and wasn't afraid of showing how authentic he really was. President Bush was not concerned about what people thought about him, about how he reacted about showing his emotions. He went on to say at President Reagan's funeral, as his vice president for eight years, I learned more from Ronald Reagan than from anyone I encountered in all my years of public service. I learned kindness, we all did. I also learned courage, the nation did. And then I learned decency, the whole world did. And most importantly as anything, I learned a lot about humor, a lot about laughter. And oh, how he loved a good story. When I asked, how did your visit go with Bishop Tutu? He replied, so-so. <laughs> it was typical and it was wonderful. Uh, Dr. J. Don Edwards, I don't know if Dr. Edwards is here, here today. But he's been an esteemed member of the University of Georgia faculty for so many years and a remarkable friend and a mentor. And I learned from Dr. Edwards to always speak up. Don't be bashful. Those that know Dr. Edwards know that uh, bashful and uh, is not in his vocabulary, okay? He's very opinionated. Uh, but he always did it in a respectful manner. And he always treated people with respect and didn't judge people too quickly. As a young UGA staff member back in the 80s, I quickly learned that Dr. Edwards was a very vocal and influential member of the board. Better keep him informed, and he's on top of his game at all times. We always made sure Dr. Edwards was up to speed on everything, but I've also learned so much from Dr. Edwards in a life away from athletics in the real world. Dr. Edwards has been a true friend of my dad who's battling some memory loss challenges at age 87. 
Dr. Edwards said, sat by your dad at Sunday school the other day. He noticed the G in my lapel, and he asked, where did I get that? He said, you know where I'm coming from, don't you? Well, message delivered, message received, and I learned that I probably needed to spend more time paying attention to the little things in life, and that something as simple as a Georgia logo G lapel pin would mean so much to someone. But I've always enjoyed his company, and needless to say, I got my dad a lapel G pin very, very quickly the next time I saw him. Former First Terry Speaker, former Terry First Thursday Speaker, Dan Cathy was addressing the University of Georgia student body at the University of Georgia Chapel earlier this spring, and I continued to learn about customer service. Mr. Cathy talked about his leadership style and the successes of Chick-fil-A to a packed house. I did not want to miss this opportunity to hear him since his restaurants are my favorite and there's nothing better than a grilled chicken sandwich, okay? How did he, man how did he manage to effectively train so many employees? For those that have heard Mr. Cathy speak, you've probably already heard of this, but bear with me. It taught me so much about explaining leadership and ideas how to get the message across to his staff on customer service. But about midway through the speech, um, Mr. Cathy brought out an old doctor's kit. I mean, it was just one of these old things you see that the doctors on TV would, would bring out. But he, had a, he, he asked one of the students, he said, just reach in there and grab something. So the first thing that the student brought out was a shoe brush just old shoe brush. he said you know what you know you know what this is for and the student said no I have no clue he said well to really do a good job of customer service you've got to get down on your knees and you got to polish your your customer's shoes you have to let them know that they're important the next thing he did he brought out he, he went through a series of bringing out a baton like in a relay race you know why do I have this baton well you've got to have a good succession plan to be successful like in a relay You've got to hand that baton off. You can't drop it or you're out of the race. And at the end, he brought out a slinky, you know, just this little slinky. He had a slinky sitting on top of the table. And uh, he said, do you know why I've got this slinky? And we didn't have any idea. But all these slinkies had the Chick-fil-A logo on them. And he gave everybody a slinky as they left the place. But he said, you know what, I want my staff. He said, this slinky's like my staff. He says, you know, if you stretch it out, he said, you've got an unhealthy working environment. Everybody's stressed. You don't want to have this slinky out this way. And then he put the slinky on just sitting there. He says, you don't want to be there either because the thing's not doing anything. You want, and then he started holding it up and doing this. He says, you need to be about right here where you're on edge to where you know you've got to be accountable. But it was really stuck with me, and if you're in my office the next time, you'll see that slinky right in the middle. But uh, I have always felt, and I've talked about this before, that we really want all our staff on edge. Uh, I think from an accountability standpoint, I've grown up in an environment at the University of Florida for 18 years that you better come today every you better come to work every day with your A game. You cannot take a day off. I mean, you need to take a day off. Don't get me wrong, but when you're at work, you better not take a day off because you know what? If you're in the compliance office. And you're just in the office checking websites and stuff like that. All of a sudden, next thing you know, you're going to be in trouble. And I don't need to get in trouble. I don't need to mention trouble in college athletics because we all see what's out there with, you know, our friends at Tennessee and Ohio State, Southern Cal. It's uh, it's not a good time. We can talk about that a little bit later. But uh, college athletics, we've got to kind of clean up our act pretty quickly before others take charge. I've always enjoyed reading Ben Stein's column. And from him, I have learned more on servant leadership. In his final column, he stated, It gives me a shiver to write my final column. I have been doing this for so long that I, can't, I cannot even recall when I started. I never thought it would end. After discussing who he viewed as the real stars in life, those, those who serve our community and country and not those in Hollywood, as he said, there are plenty of stars in the American firmament the teachers and nurses who throw their whole spirits into caring for autistic children. But he ended his column with the following words, I came to realize that life lived to help others is the only one that matters, and that is my duty. And in return for the lavish life God has given me, I am able to help others he has placed in my path. This is my, high, this is my highest and best use as a human. I learned about hard work and loyalty from my greatest mentor, Dan McGill, who I'm sure will. He's mentored so many people. Um, 
Coach and I go back, gosh, so many years. I mean, I started working for him. I call it working. Uh, he used to call himself Dan the Baptist. And uh, when we worked on Sunday, he would say, well, you know, can you work on Sunday? And I said, well, Coach, I might need to go to church. He said, Dan the Baptist is preaching today. You need to come to work today. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, but a phenomenal man. He just, uh, he turned 90 back in January, and we celebrated his birthday in Athens. And uh, for those, if you were one of the 800 people there, we had to turn people away at the, his birthday celebration. Uh, that was something that was richly deserved, and he's in the office probably every other day. Just want to talk about tennis and the NCAA championships that come up next year in Athens, and uh, just but just what a man. But he's, you know, Coach McGill has uh, meant so much to so many people, and uh, to say if you you can't really just pick on one thing that he was he excelled at. But I will say this: there's no one, and you can you can put the list up of individuals that have worked at the University of Georgia, but there's absolutely no one that's done more for their institution and can care less about any emphasis on himself. I mean, it's phenomenal what he has done. He could have, he could have gotten some really impressive jobs during the height of his career. I mean, he's such a talented person. You know what? He loved the University of Georgia, still loves it to this day, and still wears that Georgia hat every day. And, Will, you see that old bad white sweat white sweater he's got he wears it every day and I, some days i think he has breakfast on it but uh <laughs> but we've got to get him some new tennis gear if you get with manny and make sure that he gets that stuff done uh you know during my early early years at the university of georgia uh, georgia back and i would say early from 1981 through 1992 there's a gentleman that uh was my direct supervisor named lee haley i don't know if that name rings a bell to anyone here but uh Coach Haley was the athletic director at Auburn University, uh, I think a teammate of Coach Dooley's at Auburn. Well, when Pat Dye left East Carolina to go to Auburn, uh, Coach Haley lost his job. So Coach Dooley, in his wisdom, quickly picked up Coach Haley to come be his right-hand man. And for those of you that know Lee, Lee Haley, who, who passed away several years ago, but you're talking about a gentle giant there, a man that was so much like Joel Eves in the way he – uh, kind of protected the money of the athletic association. Um, just probably one of the greatest mentors anyone could have. All his door was always open. You could always go in his office and say, "Coach, how do you, how do you build the budget? You know, why do we do this? Why do we do that?" And I think today, uh, and I'm guilty of it too, is that we get so busy in what we do, we don't offer that opportunity for for individuals to come in and and let them learn. I mean, the possibility of having a 10- or 11- or 12-year-old working around in an athletic environment really doesn't happen now. Uh, life has changed so much, but if uh, people like Lee Haley and Dan McGill had not really kind of opened up their heart and opened up their time, uh, we, people like me would have had a very, very difficult time getting uh, where we are today. But uh, Coach, ha Coach Haley was the best as far as compassion. He could tell you no. He could give you a no, and you leave the office feeling good about it. But he had a, a gentle way of doing that, but he would take time and explain it and basically understand what the decision is. And I think that's one thing that we're trying to do at our organization is, is get as much input as you can. You know, I love healthy confrontation. Absolutely love it. And I think if we have more of that in our department, the better off we're going to be. I want people that come with ideas, that uh, sort of a devil's advocate. I love devil's advocates. But, again, it's all how you communicate. There's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to do that. But I do think that that's important. And, finally, even though we've only worked together since August, uh, Dr. Michael Adams has really showed me what it means to be invested in an institution. After witnessing his work ethic, I promise you he can work, he can work circles around anyone in our athletic association, including myself. Whether it's a luncheon, a speaking engagement, or hosting one of the numerous dinners on campus at the President's home, he is always on. And that's very difficult to do. Those that have, those are in that type of work, if you're not on, and let's say you, you know, you don't prepare for an event, or you just, you know, you're not really there, just think of how that one impression is going to affect someone. But I know he, he, he talks about being on all the time, and for someone that's Literally, until he gets some vacation time, he is on all the time. But that's a great lesson to learn is that, you know, you better be on because you don't know who's going to be listening. Somebody may not like the speech or the content, but 
you've got to at least show that you're prepared and you've got your act together. But I think he certainly does that. Uh, tremendous passion for the University of Georgia. And, and when he does retire, I can assure everyone that his tank will be on empty. Be that's because he'll give everything he has and then some. Um, in closing, it's a privilege to be with you this morning. Uh, great things are happening on our campus, and I'm very fortunate to be on a team that simply wants to be the best in everything we do. If you set lofty goals, you might not reach them, but you'll know in your heart you gave the effort necessary to attain that goal. Uh, that's, my, that's my talk this morning. I'd like to just kind of open it up to questions. I know there may be many. Uh, everything's on the table. And I'll, if I can't comment on something, I'll certainly tell you, but I would be more than happy to answer any questions you may have about any facet of our operation or the Athletic Association. But let's... We uh, just... Yeah, and... Uh, please remember that uh, this is a big room, uh, so we want everyone to hear the question. We're also recording this. So if you've got a question, please raise your hand. We've got uh, a couple people with microphones who will come around to you. Come on, Slon. I know you or Knox got a question somewhere. We planted that question. You remember? No, I'm just kidding. Yes, sir. Greg, uh, Title IX has been in existence for many years now, and we remember that the first casualty was men's gymnastics. On a day-to-day -day basis, how does that play out as far as your management of athletics and the, the prioritization and allocation? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, right now, the enrollment numbers, part of the, there are different prongs of the Title IX uh, compliance piece, and part of that is you have to match your student population with athletic scholarships. Uh, I think the latest data, we were 61% female on our campus, 39% male. Uh, in scholarships, we're about 50-50. So that 10 to 11 point gap is, is way too much. So sometime over the next three or four years, we will um, more than likely add another women's sport. I do not think you'll see us add a men's sport. We will not drop a sport. But I think what you'll see is we'll probably uh, add a women's sport, whether that's uh, women's lacrosse. Uh, I know that's a, that's a favorite of mine. Uh, you've got field hockey. You've got uh, bowling. But I didn't know how beer and cigarettes would work at a, at a collegiate <laughs> bowling match. Uh, so we probably will not be adding bowling. But, uh, but that's something we're going to have to add. Uh, I think what you see is I'm, I'm, I think there is on our campus an uh, uh, intramural women's lacrosse team. So I'm sure as we go down the, uh, the trek here, uh, Dr. Carla Williams, who's my right-hand person, she is in charge of our Title IX compliance and is on top of that subject. But it's something that we have to watch very closely. And I think the one good thing at the University of Georgia, probably as well as all the other SEC schools, is the, uh, the resources that are dedicated to really all sports, uh, fully funded in scholarships. Uh, there's enough money to recruit, travel, things of that nature. So uh, those are things that are always on our radar. But I think you'll see uh, – I, we, we, I know we will not – I mean, what men's sport would we, would we get rid of? They're, they're none. Uh, but we would probably add a women's sport down the road at some point in time within the next five years. Yes, sir. Where do you see – where do you see our greatest uh, deficiencies and areas that need improvement in order for us to get back to where we were maybe five, six years ago when we were in the top ten in this Sears right. trophy? We, we've got some sports that uh, are in the top ten. We've had a really good spring. You know, men's tennis finish, gets to the final four, the women get to the final eight. But what you, you've got to get off to a great start in the fall. Uh, we did not scratch in football, volleyball, soccer, Cross country, men and women, and we did score in uh, men's indoor track. One person scored, I think, six points, so we were 50th in the country or something like that. But you've got to start off really, really good in the fall, and that's where we really uh, have to step it up. We have a new volleyball coach, Lizzie Stimke, uh, that was, uh, I think she's going to do great things for our program. Our soccer team was really on the cusp of of making it to the NCAA championship. Probably the biggest sport we've got to do to really, and 
I'm being loyal to Wayne here, but uh, we've got to get our track program up and going. Uh, in that, the way they compute the uh, tabulate scores is that track is the only sport that has six opportunities to score points. Men's and women's cross country, men's and women's indoor track, men's and women's outdoor track. So if you won every one of those, which is not going to happen, you get 100 points for finishing first, that's 600 points. So we have not, we did not have a very good uh, uh, track season. Uh, we finished 40th and 58th at the NCAA championships, and that's just one person on each side. So, you know, we've got to really get our track program up and going. Uh, we're going to dedicate the resources, the I guess the time and effort it takes to do that. I would love to see if we have some uh, football players that would love to run track in the spring. Uh, it's amazing what you can do with your relay teams if you get four really quick guys out there. Uh, that's where you can really score some big points. So we've got, you know, our goal is to have every team in the NCAA championship. Uh, we did not get that done this year, especially in the fall. But we've got to start off in the fall to where our teams are in the na if they if they just get to the national championship, not the national championship game, but the national championship, you're gonna you're gonna score points. Now when you get there. Your teams, like women's swimming, finish second. Chris Hack and the men's golf team finished second. That's 90 points. So right now we're, I think, 22nd before you add in softball, baseball, track, uh, your points there. So we should be in the top 20 this year. But we've got to – we've been kind of going this way uh, to where we were 20th last year. You know, we've got to get up back on the upward sled. There's no reason we should not be in the top 10. I mean, there's, there's just no reason. We have the resources. We have the facilities, um, and our coaches know what they need to do. I mean, we, we express that to them. I don't, I don't tell them how many wins they need, things of that nature, but they know they've, they've got to be competitive in the SEC. If you're competitive in the SEC, you're going to be competitive nationally. So we've just got to pick it up in, in a few sports and uh, match the effort that, you know, our tennis programs have been tremendously successful. Our, Jack Bowerly has done a phenomenal job with our swimming program. Andy Landers, the last two years, gone to the Sweet 16. You know, everybody said everybody complains about women's basketball. And God, we don't go any further. I said, you know, if our men's team was going to the Sweet 16 two years in a row, they'd be doing cartwheels down Broad Street. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Mark's got his program up and running. You know, it's a big year for our football team. Uh, but you've got to really get off to a great start in the fall, and that's that's one thing we've got to do is get off on the right foot this year. Yes, sir. Got you both ways. Hi. Uh, so you talked about uh, the athletics uh, side of the house and the academic side being on the same page right. with the state uh, budget affecting the the uh, academic side of the house. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts on the athletic side sharing resources with the ac academic side? Well, I think that's what, what it's all about. Our We just left the SEC meetings a few days ago down in Destin, and they're going to cut us a check for about $18 million dollars. That's from all the revenue that's generated off the TV packages with ESPN, CBS. That's from the money generated from bowls. That's money generated from really all the different things that the SEC sponsors. I mean, 18 million bucks, okay? Our operating budget's right around $90 million. Uh, but that's, that's kind of the environment I've grown up in at Florida. It was very, very pro-academics. Uh, we want to give back. And you get that check for $18 million, I mean, we need to do certain things. Uh, we want to be a piece. We want to be a part of that. We've got – it's well, well documented that, you know, we are a uh, – I don't know how we do this in the future, but uh, there's been a lot of publicity on how uh, much revenue we generate at the end of the year. I think we're – I haven't seen it yet, but some say we're the second most profitable athletic association in the country. So you're right. We should share some of that SEC money. And that's what we do, and I think it's gone to great things. Uh, Samantha Joy, part of what we do is endow uh, different chairs in different departments at the University of Georgia. And Dr. Samantha Joy is uh, one of the chairholders sponsored by the Athletic Association, and we know the amount of uh, publicity she's generated back to the University of Georgia with the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. She is the really the, the, the expert on that, and that makes us – that we feel good about that, and I think that those that are in those um, different departments feel good about that too. So I always believe in sharing the wealth, and if we can do some things to help when budget cuts and certain things are, are present, as it is on all institutions, not in this state, but really everywhere, we feel like we can help in those situations, and we're, we're happy to do so. 
Yes, sir. Well, I, th I think uh, – I know Coach Spurrier got a little publicity out of that. He's a crafty old guy. He knew that was going nowhere. Okay, I've been around him long enough to know that he just threw the bait out there and saw, saw who, who ran with it. You know, schools like Georgia could afford that, but I think once you start, where do you stop? I mean, we've got 500 student athletes, so are we compensating the football player the same as we are the women's tennis player? Um, I think what gets lost in the shuffle is the tremendous amount of kind of a proving – proving ground that we provide. Uh, if you're an out-of-state student, you think about it. It's what, about 40 grand to go, go to school now. You're getting the best training possible. Will can, Will can attest to this. You, you know, we're starting a big nutrition program now. We're getting involved in that. So these, these young people are coming. They're getting the best strength and conditioning that they possibly can. They're getting a phenomenal education. You know, and in some situations, let's just call it like it is, in some situations they probably would not be on campus if they did not participate in athletics, okay? So you've got to factor all these things in there. You travel well, you sleep well, you eat well. You've got resources to everything. You've got tutorial services that are off the chart. Ted White and his staff and academic office are just phenomenal. The, the great stories that come out of that office are just too many to mention here. But I... I don't think you're going to see that. I think there's some schools that, that you know, they are, a, they are a financial drag on an institution. Uh, there are very few athletic associa uh, associations out there that generate revenue themselves. And we're fortunate to be one of, those, one of the handful of schools that do that. But you've, the majority of our peers in the business are just fighting just to make their budgets meet at the end of the year. So, you know, we're able to probably make some comments and do some things in the Southeastern Conference because we are – uh, in good financial shape. So I just don't think that's the, uh, the atmosphere throughout the entire landscape of college athletics. So I'm kind of against it. You know, if you give them 200, why not 300? You know, what are they? Just something I don't think we want to go down that road. We want to maximize their experience because they are, you know, student athletes at the end of the day. They're there to get an education. The number of kids that come out and make it in professional sports are probably less than 1% of your entire student population. So the majority of people are there for the right reason, to get that education, to be good citizens. And I think the life skills that they learn on the spot for their four-year or five-year period are invaluable. I don't think you can put a dollar figure to that. Yes, sir. Hi. You mentioned um, that successful people soak up all the knowledge. And then you also touched on how there's all this negative publicity in college sports now. Right. So yourself being a successful person, how are you going to prevent any negative publicity for the Georgia Athletic Association compared to all the bad things that are going on with all the other colleges? Well, you've got to, uh, you've got to constantly talk about doing the right thing. I mean, we've, uh, I, I send out probably staff emails. Uh, I talk about, well, we meet as a staff once a month. We have what's called just a staff breakfast. We bring everybody on. And I make a point to, to talk about leadership, to talk about doing the right thing. Um, like I've always said, it's not what you do when people are watching. It's what do you do when people aren't watching. And uh, uh, we stress to our staff, you know, if, if what you do every day, if it appeared in the paper the next day, would you be proud of it? So there's just some certain things that we can do. And, you know, we've got almost 300 staff members, as I said, 500 student athletes, and thousands and thousands of boosters, athletic reps, uh, fans, and so that is a constant concern is how do we know we've got our thumb on everything? Um, and at some point in time, you have to trust your staff. But there's some situations now, like you mentioned, that are out there that uh, uh, I think that are, that are so unfortunate. Could they have been avoided? I think some could have been avoided. And I think every – what we do is in those three situations, we try to learn from those. I tell you what, you, you see what's happening there. The first thing you do is say – do we have our bases covered on our campus? I mean, we go back, we ask questions, we do certain things. It was uh, in the paper I was up in Indianapolis last Friday in an NCAA meeting and uh, in a setting to where I never want to have our institution in that setting. I promise you that. It is not a good feeling to be before the NCAA Infractions Committee. Okay, it wasn't our institution, but I was there trying to learn and see how the, see how the process ran. But you can... 
you just have to do your due diligence every day as far as preaching the right thing. I think the students, from an accountability standpoint, uh, there are consequences for poor decisions. And I just think the more you can preach about that as far as learning from others, as far as just constantly talking about it to where it becomes a mindset. And that mindset is at the University of Georgia, you don't need to cheat. You don't need to cheat. You know, there's no reason to. Um, I'm not bragging here, but I think we, we have all the resources necessary. Our facilities, folks, are off the charts. They are could, – could, do some institutions have better facilities? Yes. But I think you take the whole picture of all our facilities, you will certainly see that, you know, we have some of the finest facilities. Our goal, and it all kind of gets back to customer service, is making sure that little things like the bathrooms. I mean, we're renovating bathrooms in the Sanford Stadium this year in the uh, – east and west end zones we just you know if you saw them today you'd probably scratch your head and say what's going on so we're updating some of these things we want to uh to really focus our summer retreat this year is all focused on customer service it's all we're going to talk about and uh and it's not just something that we'll talk about this year we're going to talk about it every year because that's something that you see in successful organizations is the way you treat the customer uh, we may not win every game, but we want to do everything possible we can to make that experience the best it can be, and we've just kind of scratched the surface on that. Yes, sir. Uh, I know Herschel was in Athens a couple weeks ago, and I was just curious as to maybe what his purpose for being there was and if he got anything accomplished. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Herschel, uh, Herschel, that was the first time I think he'd come back to campus publicly in a long time. But his relationship with Mike Cavan is uh, strong as it always has been. The, the, real, the real purpose of that, getting Herschel back, was so we could interact with our student athletes, especially our freshmen. Uh, we wanted to um, let those young men see what it's like to be uh, at the peak of your career. And you look at Herschel right now, and he could play right now. Uh, he actually was able to work out with the team one morning. And uh, you're talking about a sponge now. You saw guys like Aaron Murray. You saw guys, uh, Christian Robinson, Orson Charles. They were like a shadow to Herschel the whole time. They wanted to soak up every bit of not, you know, just ask him questions. How did you do this? But um, that was part of his uh, – reason for coming back was to talk. Uh, he had several conversations with some individuals and giving them sort of a snapshot of what to expect, basically how to conduct themselves. And I think it was just sort of a good feeling, too, for him to come back. He was able to, uh, I mean, Mike Cavan took him down by our maintenance staff one day, and you would have thought they had seen, well, they saw Herschel. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, to see that, and it was amazing. They were just walking through campus. I was not there to see this, but they sort of went in the bookstore just to kind of see what stuff was in there. And it was, he was like a magnet in there, even to kids that were attracted to him that weren't even born when he played football here. But Herschel's going to be around a lot more. His, uh, he's, uh, he was with our women's basketball team in Dallas this year for the, when we went to the Sweet 16. He gave the team the pep talk before we played Texas A&M. You know, we were down like 40 at the half against Texas A&M, so we told him, Herschel, no more pep talks to our women's <laughs> basketball team. But he's, uh, he's still, I think he's got some more fighting in him with this uh, cage fighting, whatever that's called. So uh, it's better for him to do that than, than anybody else. Time for one more one question. More. Yes, sir. Greg, from the outside and now the inside, what's the perception that you have of the football program and Coach Rick? And God bless you for all the customer service stuff if we go six and seven again that's not gonna be good <laughs> <coughs> well you're right I'm just hoping so the letters I get are for soggy hot dog buns or something like that okay that's the kind of that's the kind of questions I want folks I you know call it like it is uh, we were you know nobody likes being six and seven I remember coming in after that Colorado game one and four I'm sitting there saying you know, we get back at 7 in the morning after the Colorado game. We we're fixing to play Tennessee. I said, what in the heck is going on here? I hadn't been 1-4 in anything. Maybe not even in Y softball back in the days. <laughs> so I, my head's spinning. I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, but I do know one thing. You couldn't keep doing what you were doing. 
because uh, if you keep doing the same thing every day, you're going to keep getting the same results. So Mark and I had a really good conversation on that Monday, and uh, uh, he was the first to mention that, you know, probably preseason he didn't handle the right way. Should have had a lot more contact. And uh, I thought you saw a flip in the in the whole team for the Tennessee game. And granted, you know, we beat a lot of teams that didn't have a lot of success this year. But uh, there's no – I mean, Mark knows what's at stake. I don't have to really go in there and say, hey, Mark, you got to win seven, eight, nine, ten games. They, they're big boys. They know what, they know what the deal is. Um, I don't think anybody's happy with mediocrity. I mean, it's a, it's a tough business. Uh, but I'm, I, it's kind of you, – you have to show a lot of patience, I think. Uh, I was coming in and, you know, heck, I hadn't met Mark Rick before August, the, you know, before I got there. So I had to get to know people. I had to see kind of what went on. And uh, Mark's made some changes. I think the best change, and Knox has experienced this, but I think the biggest change in our program was uh, in strength and conditioning. Uh, getting Joe Tereshinsky back and uh, John Casey, who I'm going to tell you what, he's 62 years old going on 40. If you've been around that man, he is uh, salt of the earth. And bringing back Thomas Brown, probably one of the greatest players in Georgia history as far as just work, work ethic. Uh, graduate of the University of Georgia, does things the right way. So we've just got a motivated staff in there. And I think what you're seeing in the, in the press releases from what these kids are saying about what they're getting out of that part of the program is, uh, is a huge change. I was not here, obviously, last spring, last January. So I did not know what the program was. But I knew that, you know, as Mark and I talked through things, that was something that he was really high on doing was, was changing that part of it. But uh, we're off to a great start there. I'm going to tell you what, our kids are buying in. Uh, I can see them running around our track every day because my office is kind of right in the corner. And when you see some of these uh, big, big guys running around our track pretty quickly, it's, uh, it's a good sight to see. So I think that, uh, you know, six and seven, nobody's happy with that. You know, I'm not, I'm, I don't enjoy that. I didn't enjoy the season at all except for six games. But uh, but we know what's at stake there. I've got I've got confidence. I mean, Mark Mark did it at one time. I mean, we had some great years early on. Uh, I was able to look at that from the outside in. But you know, we just got to get back to doing what made us successful. So I'm confident that Mark can do that. Uh, and so we get a pretty quick test this year: Boise State and South Carolina. And uh, we'll have our hands full of those two games. But heck, they're both in the state of Georgia. We're gonna have. All our fans at both those games, uh, Boise State's at, at 8 o'clock, and then South Carolina's at 4.30, which I think all our fans love, the 3.30 slot. Heck, I like the 3.30 slot. That means you're on CBS normally. CBS doesn't televise that day because they're televising the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament. So uh, that's why we're playing at that window that CBS normally has. But um, it's going to be exciting. I don't think you're going to see any empty seats in our stadium. We've kind of restructured the student ticket allotment, which – allows us to, uh, if the students don't pick up their tickets, they don't let us know they're coming by Thursday, then we're able to basically sell those tickets to others that want to come to our game. So that was a frustrating point for all those that went to game. You saw all those empty student tickets. Well, heck, last year all I had to do was show up. So we didn't know who was coming and who wasn't. So we fixed that to where we're going to have a, a packed house one way or another for every, uh, especially for the South Carolina game. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Greg, thank you so much for uh, talking with us and being so uh, open with uh, answering all those questions. On behalf of our alumni board, I want to present you with this uh, glass sculpture wow. by a local artist, uh, Loretta Eby. Wow. Thank you very much. All right. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thanks a lot, Dean. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.